and welcome to the Startup, Startup Advantage Show. I'm Eric Carlson of Business Lexington. We're coming to you from the West Six Brewery in Lexington, Kentucky. And I'm joined today, as I always will be, by Randall Stevens, founder of Startup Advantage and three of his own startup companies. And our guest today, Ben Askren, who, Ben, tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the endeavors you've been involved in. Um, I have a long career with Lexmark. I've been there years. And a year and a half ago, I left and joined my own company. We're developing smart owned pet app construction and engineering trades. Mm -hmm. And in addition to all that, um, with Randall and several other people, we all got together about four years ago and started this group called Intellex. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to promote Lexington as a creative and technical hub for entrepreneurs and business professionals. And that on top of the show is what we're doing here today. Randall, talk a little bit about what it is that we're here for and what it, the mission of Startup Advantage and Intellex has been. Well, like Vince said, we started a group called Intellex about four years ago, <clears throat> a couple years into it, uh, back in 2010. Uh, I decided to uh, kind of rally some other people around town who were interested specifically in tech startups, and we started a group that meets, used to meet monthly, uh, now we kind of meet on demand called Startup Advantage, and the goal of the group was to, um, I really have to give credit um, uh, to Steve Blank, who is uh, now teaching entrepreneurship out at uh, out of Stanford, but I was consuming a lot of Steve Blank's uh, teachings about what it meant, uh, kind of new thinking around startups, and uh, so a bunch of us around town decided that, you know, there was enough new knowledge coming, uh, you know, kind of into the marketplace of thinking about what it means to successfully be able to start and run companies, especially tech companies that are designed to scale, that we decided that uh, we should make sure that that information was getting out. So we started meeting, started with monthly meetings. We were uh, averaging anywhere from 30 to 60 folks every month that would come out. We would have different lectures uh, every month. Um, in 2011, on the success of those monthly meetings, we actually put on a, a full day conference in April of 2011 and had about 150 people from the region and brought some speakers in from all over the country um, uh, for that event. Uh, was successful there. This In 2012, we started experimenting with trying to make it a regional event. Uh, so we've had some events in Louisville where we were cross-pollinating entrepreneurs. Uh, a lot of the goal was can we just really get entrepreneurs out knowing each other and talking to one another, uh, starting with entrepreneur to entrepreneur and then obviously trying to then mix in investor community into that. So we did that in Louisville. Um, we actually had an event in Northern Kentucky and just started trying to cross pollinate, make it more of a regional event. What we're doing now is thinking again, you know, like any good startup, just keep experimenting until we see what works, what doesn't work. So the goal of the show now that we're, uh, of which this is the first is can we can we scale this information even more? So rather than people having to physically be at a meeting, we'll still periodically have uh, physical get-togethers like we are here tonight at West Sixth. But uh, we're going to start uh, doing interview shows like this, getting uh, you know entrepreneurs like Ben and others around the region, and capturing that, uh, making it available to everybody, and uh, hopefully can keep spreading as much information and news about all the things that are going on and the excitement around the entrepreneurial community. And obviously you believe in the critical mass of entrepreneurs to be in a space and gather together and share ideas. What about that is important to cultivating the community of entrepreneurship? Well, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you know it's probably the loneliest job on the planet. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always a really, it's a tough, tough road uh, when you're starting a company. And a lot of that is, is can you surround yourself with a support network that, you know, not only just from a, uh, just kind of keeping spirits high, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, people that are, that are involved in entrepreneurship that, you know, one of the traits of an entrepreneur is that you have to be able to stomach the extreme highs and lows, emotional highs and lows that go along with it. Uh, these things don't happen overnight. It's uh, largely an experiment when you're uh, trying to start something new. So there's lots of uh, peaks and valleys um, uh, that you have to go through. So. A lot of the thinking is is that you want to surround yourself. You know, it's one of the other one of the reasons that uh, a lot of people say you should also have a co-founder, and a lot of that is to be able to moderate those extreme highs and extreme lows with each other, 
uh, uh, to be able to try to even that out. You know, I think for people that have been through it several times, like myself, as you said, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my third startup, started my first company 20 years ago. You know, probably about 10 years into it, I finally figured out to, to how to not freak out over the over the lows uh, when you're when you're in the middle of those troughs. So I, I think that a lot of what the thinking around trying to get these groups together, get people out knowing each other, is just you know not only for business purposes, but the learning that comes from that. Uh, always talking what people have learned from their own experiences, being able to share that around in the community uh, of other entrepreneurs, and then obviously to have that support network. So we even uh, here in Lexington, we have a uh, uh, breakfast uh, group of just CEOs of tech companies that we get together once a month, and it's really just a sounding board. What's going on? Does anybody have any issues that they're dealing with that they just want to bounce around the table? And, and so uh, we call that a C-Tech is what we call that group. So uh, just lots of uh, just a general support network. Is um, ben, you said you spent nearly 20 years as an employee at Lexmark Printer Company here in Lexington. and in that you said the last two and a half, three years, you know, really involved with intellects and the different things that grew out from that. What was it about that time that allowed you, to, or made you go ahead and realize that you could make BuildCalc, your company, a reality? Well, it's, a, it's like two parallel stories, actually. Um, on the one hand, I was very involved with my career at Lexmark, and recruiting and retention was really important to me at that time. In doing so, myself and many others realized that it was Lexmark would go through these peaks and valleys in our recruiting, and as a result, that lack of consistency caused us problems with bringing people and talent in from the outside. Plus, in this region, Lexmark is the only really strong player in that high-tech industry segment with a wide diversity of talent in the engineering and development sectors. That was a problem for us. When we looked at the problem very objectively, we got Toyota involved with it as well because they had similar issues, and we discovered that it was more than just our hiring habits that the region this size and being kind of isolated without there being other anchor companies, the fluidity of the job market was a big negative against this as well. So we asked, well, could we start to leverage our strengths a little bit more? And that's where Intellects got started because in essence, Commerce Lexington heard Lexmark's and Toyota's issues and they started to ask other entrepreneurs like Randall, for your smaller business, are you facing the same problems of bringing in the right finance guy, the right sales guy? Are you having issues where people won't relocate because of their concern about the fluidity of the job market? Mm -hmm. When those concerns were weighted, they said, okay, we can't fix the fluidity instantly, but what we can do is raise the quality of life to such a high level that that outweighs and, and makes it much easier for people to accept a position here. Focus came from city government to make things happen. Groups like Intellects were formed to try to be able to heighten the awareness of the quality of life and the environment conducive towards being a professional in the technical area as well as being an entrepreneur in that area. And the networking was huge. Bringing this community together, it never had happened before. And what we quickly discovered is there was a lot of common ground between the entrepreneurs and the techies with regard to not just the kind of work we were doing, but also our view of the world, their view of our community. So that was part of that story and that leap. Okay, that's opening in me as an individual, my eyesight with regard to, hey, I met this guy like Randall, he's a lot like me, he's doing it. I'm starting to think about this. The parallel to that, I've always had a little bit of interest in being an entrepreneur myself. My father was an entrepreneur and, and I saw through him the, the downfalls and the positives, the highs and the lows that Randall's talked about. And I wondered, would that be right for me? I'm a little more conservative in nature, and so I was always looking for the right opportunity that matched my skills and interests. And really it was the concurrence with mobile computing that I discovered, okay, here's an opportunity that hasn't been around since the mid 1980s. If I don't seize this chance, it's not gonna happen again. And so it was, I remember the day specifically, it was a spring day of 2009. I went over to a friend's house who's a carpenter and I said, give me every single book you have about carpentry math. I'm gonna write a nap. And, and he knew me well enough, he didn't laugh. You know, he did it here. Be serious. Yeah, and so uh, nine months later, I published the app, and it's been a lot of fun since then. But you, were, you kept your day job while you were doing that, right? Kept my day job the entire time. And I would recommend that to anyone. If you've got a, a good day job, you should keep it. I mean, you're learning things at that day job, and it's supporting your family. It's giving you an income flow. Work on your business in your own time. 
develop that income stream, prove that concept out. Like Randall said, it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. And you really ought to take advantage of the fact that you're still getting a regular paycheck to be out there trying different things until the right model clicks. How far were you into it before you knew, I mean, did you have to actually write the entire mm -hmm. app before you even really knew if it was going to be accepted in the market or were you able to experiment in smaller chunks in some way? No, I had to write the entire app. Um, it was, I was fortunate enough that I entered the market very early. Um, I think it had been open to developers for about a year at the time I opened, I entered my app. But at that time there wasn't any really strong players in the construction calculator market. Once I got the app out there, immediately people recognized the app as being something different than what was already out there. And that gained a lot of traction. So I was fortunate to have that as my main marketing tool. Right. How did having things like Intellects and Startup Advantage, these groups that you had already networked with, had already become close friends with, how did it help having that network to work with you while you were doing this project? Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I have a very personal story on that. Um, early on in the sales of the app, um, well, let me back up and tell you, the app itself started off as an emulator for a handheld calculator that I used quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted that on the phone. I, I went so far as to even call the company up and I asked them, are you going to get into mobile apps? And at that time, I don't think they understood the question. And they, they said, <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. So I developed the app because I wanted it. And I thought, well, if I want it, other people will too. And I was right about that. After the app had been on the market for a little over a year, um, I got a cease and desist letter in the mail. and. It was because of the networking, the people that I had met in this community, that I was quickly not able to just get an attorney, but get an attorney who specializes in that specific type of law, and took something that would have cost me a lot of money and time, and maybe wiped me out, and for a very reasonable cost, was able to address the specific problem the right way in a very professional manner, and the problem went away. Um, it was wonderful to work with that kind of talent. And that's one thing I can't emphasize enough, is the talent in this community is as strong as it is anywhere in the country if you network. So if you go out in Silicon Valley, you're going to fall into it just because the, the density is so thick. Here we don't have the density, but we still have the talent. Well, I think here in the next 45 minutes, we're going to see that talent in one area when people start coming here for our event at West 6th. What was it that, you know, obviously hearing Ben's story, these are things that happened because of the work that you guys were able to do a few years ago to get this group growing, to do things like uh, the April, uh, 2010 April is month, and, and getting the city to help recognize what type of talent we have in town. Why was that something that was important to you as someone who had already had two successful startups at that point? Uh, you know, I, I guess for me, I'm just always trying to you know, my give back is I feel like I've been through this now several times and, you know, A, I look, just love, I love the thinking around the art of a startup. So not only doing my own, but basically studying what does it mean to do this and kind of analyzing my own paths and things that I've done. And then obviously reading and, and learning from as many others as I can. So, you know, I think from a personal standpoint, I've just always had, I've had an interest in what is this startup uh, world? What is what does all this stuff mean? And like I said earlier, I uh, probably in 2009 time frame I started uh, uh, reading Steve Blank, uh, his blog at steveblank.com. And at the time, I was uh, running my second startup, which was a venture back. We'd raised a couple of rounds of venture capital, and uh, I was uh, reading Steve's blog and. A lot of the things he was talking about what not to do, I thought he was like, you know, a fly on the wall in some of my board meetings and some of the things that I felt were, uh, you know, an obstacle to, to that company moving forward. So I just I really dove into that content. And I think not only me, but I think a lot of people around the world over the last few years, and I think the startup community as a whole, is a lot of debt of gratitude to Steve. You know, there, a lot, I think a lot, of, a lot of these things about startups have been either kind of intuitive, kind of, you know, there's a lot of things that, that Steve put a language to, it's the way I think about it, that, you know, I would be like, ah, you know, I've been talking about that for years, I just wasn't calling it that, or I was referring to it as something else. So I think that there were, um, obviously, a lot of entrepreneurs that have been through it over the years, uh, but, but Steve really put uh, a language to it and a new way to, to kind of, uh, for people to think about it and then discuss it in a new way. So I think that was exciting, and so you know, in 2010, uh, 
I had left running that uh, second company, was starting up my own third one, had some time, was trying to get involved back in the, I'd been traveling a lot, uh, especially in 2008, 2009, so it was my way of kind of getting back embedded uh, in uh, kind of learning who, who else was around town doing these things, had a little more time to get involved, so uh, got involved with the Intellects group early on, and, and then again, uh, you know, in 2010, decidedly, uh, a, a narrower niche than, than the Intellects group was addressing that was you know, specifically about entrepreneurship and start tech startups, what I would call scalable startups. You know, it's not franchises or kind of more traditional. These are very specific kinds of ways of thinking and the, and the demands and the needs of, uh, of these kinds. And, you know, a, a much tougher, I'd say a much lower success rate in general because by and large, uh, companies that are in the tech world and doing things, it's something new. Yeah. Could be a completely new business model, completely new, uh, they're trying to disrupt, so not a known business model, and that's a lot of what uh, what Steve Blank and uh, a lot of the people that started talking to in the last few years was to quit thinking about business plans and start thinking about business models right. uh, and what that means and that kind of planning, so you know yeah. that was really what got me. And that's really important is that in technical startups, the rules are different. That's not bad. The rules are, I would say, maybe a little more crisper, in fact, mm -hmm. in that because in a technical startup, it's much, much more of an experiment than a normal business venture would be. Like you said, business plans don't make sense now. Now you're looking at your business model instead. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is do a whole lot more with a whole lot less and learn as much as you possibly can, and if it doesn't work, stop it quickly and go off and try the next thing to find what does work and learn from those mistakes. Traditional business models, a lot more momentum is associated with that. These plans here, that doesn't happen. Uh, people can hear in the background here that one of our new local startups in Lexington is working. We're at a, a microbrewery that was started in part with some tech startup money. Uh, one of the founders had a, his own tech startup firm in the past. and. You know, come together and done this here now. Yeah, but we should give a shout out. To yeah, absolutely. And, and Brady and, and, and uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, here at here West Sixth. Uh, but what else do we have going on here in town that that is going on as far as the tech startups in the Lexington Central Kentucky area? Well, you know, there's there's bunches of them. Most, a lot of them. You know, even the uh, the one that I'm working on now is a company called Pundit, and we've been working on it since you know for more than two years and hardly anybody has seen or heard anything of it and that's just the reality a lot of times in the early phases. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, tech startups that you know, are, are in the infancy and, and they just, people don't know about them. Um, of, you know, here in the last few months there's been a lot of attention. There's uh, I think last week at the uh, local uh, Venture Club meeting there was four gaming companies that were uh, presenting um, I have an office space uh, downtown here in Lexington, and I house one of those, uh, a guy named Wes Keltner, who's just raised some money, and he's building a uh, 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 mobile game that's a, uh, called uh, Breach and Clear, and it's a strategy game, military strategy game uh, that's going to be on both uh, iOS and Android. Uh, so they've just raised some money here uh, from the local community, and they're building that app, and uh, plan to have that game out uh, before the end of the year. So you've got a lot of got a lot of small companies like that that are that are working on things. And um, you know, I, uh, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't uh, give the shout out to you know we had we had a huge software success story here in town. Uh, in you know, the exit was in 2008, but uh, you know, a company that was started here by another serial entrepreneurs. Uh, Davis Marksbury and uh, Dan Kloiber started a company, their third company back in the late 90s, 96, 97 time frame uh, called Extreme Software. Uh, and it was a business to business. Uh, they ended up selling that company for hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, uh, in uh, 2008 to Hewlett Packard. So we now have a Hewlett Packard has a presence here in, uh, in Fayette County. A lot of that team that still has its uh, you know, intact and present here that's working in the document management space. But um, you know, uh, if you ask a lot of the people around town, they've never heard they never heard of Extreme. You know, and it was uh, a fast growth, successful company. Obviously, uh, um, the, the building that HP is in at Coldstream was built with 
the Extreme Software logo to be put on it, yep. and it was in the process when that was getting built yep. that HP exactly. came in. And then uh, from the success of that, uh, you know, Davis gave several million dollars to build a new computer science building at the University of Kentucky. So, you know, there are you know all the way from the from the very small one two two man kinds of startups to the ones that are even, you know, I would say uh, hugely successful. People still don't necessarily hear or know about them, and that's part of what we're trying to do with the groups like the Intellects and the Startup Advantage is to give a little more visibility as a, as a whole to that group and so that you know it's hard to point it at, at any one because they usually don't they don't employ hundreds of people generally uh, they're kind of the they may be uh, developing products like build calc uh, I'm sure there you probably do have some customers here but by and large it's not like you have a storefront and the high visibility right. but but you've got customers all over the world. You know, my first company, we have a company called ArcVision. We uh, developed 3D graphics software. Uh, started that company in 91. Got into the software business in the late 90s. We have customers in 120 countries around the world. So yeah. half our revenue comes from outside the U.S. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where when you're, when you're in the software business particularly, you usually, you know, especially if you're in a scaling business, the whole world is your customer. Mm -hmm. So you tend to not have a lot of visibility uh, uh, necessarily in the local community because you don't have a storefront. You're not necessarily, uh, your customers aren't necessarily here. So at, uh, you know, it gets a little lonely from that standpoint of that when you're here working and doing those things, you tend to employ, again, not thousands of people, it tends to be smaller scale from that standpoint. But the good news is there's hundreds of us around the region. So yeah. that's really what we've been trying to do with these groups is to give it a little more voice. Well, and on top of things like the Startup Advantage, the Shift Design Group, uh, you know, some of the other groups that you've got going on, you do gatherings, it's called like Geeks Night Out as a part of Intellects, to get people to come, whether it's to West Sixth Brewery or uh, even the Chambers building, but to a, an area in town so that We'd rather, we'd rather just together. so everybody knows, we'd rather come to a bar. <laughs> nothing, nothing against Palmer Selection, they have great facilities, but, but the bars and, and I, actually, I, I should, uh, I'm well, not even drinking a beer, but well, I'll get that after the show. Yeah. And I'll say that Startup Advantage turned out to be the model for intellects to do these other groups that you mentioned. Ultimately, when we saw how well Startup Advantage spun off of the people that were involved in intellects, we asked ourselves, are there other interest groups within our intellects community that we can serve as professional development groups. And so the Shift Design Group, the Run Jump Dev Gamer Group, and our Mobile Developers Group, all three came from that nexus. And yep. all three are serving. And actually another Lexmarker, Meredith Moore, really is the one that kickstarted the design group. So uh, and yeah. she, and she cheers to Meredith. Yeah, really. great implant into Lexington from SCAD. Yep. And it's coming and, and done great things here. Moved to Lexington, so. Yeah. And you know, and, and I think a lot of the reason that these groups have had success is they have been grassroots from people right. usually with a day job that just really have a passion and then trying to gather other people with that same interest so you know as Ben said we've been uh, you know referring to these as special interest groups so there's a run jump dev which is doing the game dev uh, there's a mobile developers group and, and, and run jump dev I'll say that they're not solely responsible for this renaissance of gaming in Lexington but of the four companies that were at Venture Club, all four of them are, invented, are involved with Run Jump Dev, and two of them were involved with the creation of that group. Mm -hmm. So it really is important that spreading the gospel of gaming as right. a way to be a, in a career here in this community. Yeah. What have you found about the venture community in town? Have, obviously, it's, it's something that's been around for a while, but they seem to be really taking hold and and understanding where the uh, the value is in this. Boy, you should ask that one to Randall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say that you know there is no venture presence here in Lexington. Not in the classic definition. Right. That scale um, is larger than what there we're are. Doing. There's an angel network. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a Bluegrass Angels group, uh, which has made several investments over the last few years, and uh, they've and, raised. And they have a genuine interest, I think, towards the kind of work we're doing. They're coming up to speed as to what does that mean as an investor. It's clearly new for them. Yeah, and it's, you know, I think the challenge is that, you know, in anything that you're investing in, you hope that somebody has some insight or knowledge, you know, and that's, I think that's the challenge is that as we have, you know, uh, while we're a small community, we have a lot of varied people with varied interests. 
uh, to be able to have enough critical mass that you've got enough expertise to vet the you know vet the investments mm -hmm. uh, to be able to uh, to make sure that uh, that you know in the end you want to be you want to have people making strong investments in things and having good payback and that's just healthy for the whole community. So I think it's I think it's getting healthier. Um, I, I think you know my knowledge of the Bluegrass Angel Group, which I think they raised that fund in two thousand. Yeah. Does that sound right? That sounds right. Um, you know, and I think they just raised or are in the process of maybe raising another fund um, uh, well, through I mean, that group. But they've made, you know, a uh, couple dozen investments over the last, yeah. you know, seven, six, seven years. But, uh, and, you know, just like any any investment group, you're going to have some that are successes, others that aren't. And that's just part of, uh, of playing that game. So we've, uh, I think we're, uh, w the way I would, uh, characterize the community as we're kind of all growing at the same time. We're yeah. trying to get the entrepreneurial community out. We're trying in these groups where we're trying to get more of the investor group out, mixing and mingling with the entrepreneurs because we think that that's you know the first time that the investors hear or know about one of these startups shouldn't be when that startup needs money or is coming asking for money. So right. we're uh, we're really taking the approach of trying to get the investors out at these events, you know. Uh, mixing and mingling and, and really knowing the, the people. And in the end, I'd say that that's really uh, uh, the secret to all this is you're really not investing in ideas as much as you're investing in people. And I think that that's shown itself and been talked about all over, uh, you know, at least all over the U.S. and now all over the world about what really makes startups successful. Successful entrepreneurs make startups successful, yes. and they can take, of course, their vetting out and looking for the best ideas to try to take to market and try to grow. And I think what's uh, what's common knowledge now is that investors are really trying to figure out is that the horse to bet on, and it's uh, you could take the same horse and hand them a different business to work on, and they're likely, if they're a successful entrepreneur, they're likely or at least have a better chance of being successful at anything you throw at them. So. That's a lot of, you know, and again, that ties back into how do we develop good entrepreneurs. Right. And that's really what these groups are about. And, and I know I met you guys through this process of the Intellects Group. Did you guys know each other before it was formed? No. No. What, well, that's not true. We knew each other in college, actually. College, yeah. We, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, we had, I had a drunk fraternity brother <laughs> who had a bad habit of going over to their house in the middle of dinner time and making an ass of himself. <laughs> Well, but well, the good news is, is that Ben, you know, actually the first time we were in a couple of meetings together, I'm like, I know that guy. Yeah. He hadn't changed since college. He looks exactly the same, so I remember him from uh, those days. But yeah, so but we didn't uh, really know each other in the no, professional field. No, no. He was he was stuck in a hole over in Lexmark mm -hmm. for all these years, and while all of I was I was I moved downtown with my businesses back in '98, so you know we've been pushing for more and more of the entrepreneurs to be around each other on yeah. a daily basis, mm -hmm. of being downtown and around each other. So. Anyway, well, what what did it mean then to be able to talk to someone like Randall when you were going through your process, when you were hit with a cease and desist order? Uh, oh crap! What do I do now? To have people that not only have been through uh, trials and tribulations in entrepreneurism, but that you actually know and so talk to Will. Right? Well, yeah, actually, <laughs> when I got that letter, um, I called five people. Randall was the first one, and he I had questions very pointed, like, "All right." This is the issue. Who's the best person to talk to? I've had three or four. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you don't get it yeah. you know, do you freak out, or is it like you know? Oh, what's yeah. the level of freak out that you should? Yeah, have? <laughs> and, I, and I was freaking out. So it, it definitely threw me for a loop. But it was within 24 hours after talking to Randall and Will, they talked me down. You know, and and I was prepared. Put it in perspective. Right? Yeah, it helped a lot. Not not that it's not serious, but you just have to. Right. What do you do? How do, you, how do you approach it? This isn't the end of the world, or it shouldn't be. Yeah. Any Anybody can file a cease and desist. Sure. That should be the... Yeah, speaking <laughs> of which, expect yours in the mail later today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've, as, as much as you enjoy doing your startup work, you seem to really have enjoyed being, for lack of a better word, a mentor for people that have been going through a lot of this themselves. What is it, what's been some of your favorite things about being a part of Intellect Startup Advantage to work with cultivating uh, Lexington's burgeoning entrepreneur community. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I, grad I actually graduated with a degree in architecture from UK and I uh, started my first company right out of school, but I also started teaching part-time. So I did that from 91 until 2007, just one class night, never, you know, I, cl I, uh, I 
I claimed that I never attended any fact any meetings, which was the way I wanted. I, uh, that's not true. In the early days, I did, but I, I figured out that 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 wasn't. I just w showed up, did my class uh, uh, once a week, but I did that for years, and I did that uh, by by and large not only stay uh, fresh in front of the students, but to keep my own uh, chops kind of fresh and keep up with things. And uh, you know, I think. In the end, I just like teaching. I, I like as I learn things, I like to be able to pass it on. So I think um, as got involved in the intellects and now the startup advantage, it's just kind of the teacher in me. I like to get people together, and if uh, you know, I probably like to talk too much. So uh, anybody that will stand around and listen to me, or then uh, it's my outlet. So. And it's interesting you bring up that teacher angle because I think that's true for all good entrepreneurs. Is that if you're going to build a team and bring people together, you've got to have that in you in order to communicate the vision, in order to be able to coordinate, in order to bring people on board and get up to speed quickly, you, you have to have a love for working with people in that kind of fashion and, and really giving them the gift of your knowledge. What if people now thinking about taking the plunge to, they've got an idea that's been itching at them, Hey, How do they? Calculator, the answer is don't do it. Because you'll hit them with a cease and desist order, and that one will come or, with. Or social media software around <laughs> video. That's all yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to do that. <laughs> but what advice would you give to someone now that's that's doing that? First, keep your day job, assuming yes. that you got one. Uh, you know, do it on the side as long as you can. I think the, you know, if you're specifically working in tech and software, you want to get as far down the road of. Uh, you know, I spent several several minutes earlier talking about Steve Blank. It's all about customer development. So yeah. what you want to do is you want to get your, uh, you know, what the what everybody in the in the industry now calls minimum viable product. You want to get as fast as you can yeah. the proof of concept enough that you can go out and have a conversation with a potential customer, a real and customer, get that feedback. Yeah. Right, and then ultimately you want to get to some point where you can actually exchange funds. I'll give you this if you'll give me money, because there's no better test than to show that there's enough value in what you're talking about or what you're doing. I used to, for you know, it's back to that language uh, uh, difference that I was talking about. I used to, for years, call, and I, I just had to do this for my own school of hard knocks. I used to call them happy meetings. I used to, all during the 90s, I would go to meetings and everybody would love, you know, and I used to get all this uh, joy and excitement about going to meetings because I'd go show or talk about what we were doing, and everybody loved it and was fascinated. And I, uh, I soon learned that that didn't necessarily equate into business. <laughs> so yeah. I started calling them happy meetings. It's like you got to learn how to differentiate between a happy meeting that a happy meeting doesn't necessarily equate into business. And now I think it's this customer development model. You've got to get it out there and you've got to show that somebody's actually willing not only to say that that's great, but are they willing to actually pay for it or part with their funds. Right. So you've got to, as fast as you can, tar hone in on that and target in on that. And I think. To me, what a lot of this boils down to, I call it stay in the game. The goal is when you've got an idea and you're going to start it, can you stay in the game long enough? Can you iterate fast enough to figure out what's going to work? And that may, you, know, you may meander in, in directions and you're really just trying to feel your way around what's going to work and what is the market. And usually where you start and where you think you're going to go is completely different than where you end up. And the trick is, is can you iterate through enough of those cycles to stay in the game before you run out of time, interest, or money if you're now depending on, uh, on making your living from this. So it's, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. It takes a lot of energy. And yeah. that's why I think it's not, you know, it's not, everybody's not cut out for it. And that's another reason why we like to get these groups out is, you know what, if you're, you know, sit down and really understand what this stuff means. And if you're not cut out for it, it's okay, uh, because it's, it's slaughter. <laughs> you, know, it's, you really have to have your heart into it uh, when, you, when you dive into this stuff. It's not easy. So. Where, where can someone go that may want to take part in the shift design group, run jump dev group, or the mobile development group, to, or even come out to a Geek, Geeks Night Out? Yeah. You know, I would say the Intellects, uh, I-N, the number two, L-E-X dot com, yep. and there's a Facebook page for Intellects. LinkedIn page as well. There's a LinkedIn for that as well. And that, it tends to aggregate a lot of this, you know, community calendar information about all this stuff's going on. Yeah, we got a uh, Twitter feed even. We, we just launched a... Uh, I hear that's going to take off one day. <laughs> <laughs> we it's going to be bigger than Friendster, I think. <laughs> we just launched a... Uh, Startup Advantage, uh, we've got a new Facebook page. In fact, these shows that we're now recording are going to end up being housed there, and we're going to have uh, 
We're actually going to be testing uh, my company's new software pundit for new ways to interact with this content. So, uh, uh, you know, lots of Facebook pages and, and standalone websites, but the, the Intellex is probably the place to go yeah. get the, the feed for all those, and then they each have their own uh, sites and pages. Well, great. Well, gentlemen, I think. I think it's time for us We're to. Call this a wrap. Yeah, I think we need to go thank the guys from West Six by purchasing some of their beer and start our uh, our next yes, event here tonight. So, uh, we've great. got a uh, we've got a list of about uh, Eric and I put together a list. We've got a lot fifty people that we want to uh, the hot list to do these interviews with, and uh, so so fifty no more short, episodes. No shortage of uh, people, but thanks yeah, thanks thank Ben you so for much. Being thank you, person. gentlemen. Sorry, I got empty glass, but cheers anyway <laughs> to the first cheers. first one in the can. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.